Hi, CityCast listeners. In 1865, Freedman's Town was established, creating one of the most thriving Black communities Houston has ever seen. Streets made of brick laid the paths for hundreds of bustling Black businesses. But I bet most of you have never even heard of it. I'm here today with historical researcher Deborah Blacklock Sloan and longtime Freedman's Town resident Gladys House to find out more about the deep roots of what some call a forgotten town. It's Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. I'm Carly Ann Jones, and here's what Houston's talking about today. Gladys and Deborah, welcome to CityCast Houston. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell me how both of you are connected to Freedman's Town? I'll let Gladys go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was conceived and born and still live in Freedman's Town today. Oh, wow. I'm the fifth generation of the founders of Freedman's Town. My family uh, was the Felders. So um, it's been a generational thing. <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay, and what about you, Deborah? So I am a native Houstonian. I'm a sixth generation Texan, and I am connected to Freedman's Town because I am employed with the Rutherford BHJ Museum House uh, in Freedman's Town, and that's located at 1314 Andrews. And that organization is dedicated to promoting and preserving uh, and educating people about the history of Freedman's Town. And so for people who have never heard of Freedman's Town, can you tell us where it is? Freedman's Town. Today, it's west of downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so Freedman's Town really started at Heiner and went west, according to maps. So Mm -hmm. so downtown was Fourth Ward. And so Freedman's Town actually stopped at Heiner and went west. And so the town was said to be a hub for Black culture. Could you paint the picture for me of what Freedman's Town was like in its early years? Oh, definitely. Um, We... uh, the, the word free has many meanings. Uh, it doesn't mean that all our people were enslaved. That's not true. But we were independent. Okay. You've heard of Independent Heights, but Freedman's Town was, you didn't have to go outside of Freedman's Town to shop, socialize, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. We owned all of our businesses. And therefore, we were free of any outside influence or dependence on Caucasian society, which has stolen everything from my ancestors anyway. So uh, it was just packed with people mm-hmm. and businesses uh, at every turn, you, uh, homeowners, uh, renters, you name social clubs, mm-hmm. uh, just a, a whole lot of entertainment in Freedman's Town. We also had our own uh, professional athletic stadium known as West End Park. Mm-hmm. Well, that was our stadium. Wow. Okay. Well, Satchel Page and a whole lot of uh, so called Negro greats in the sport of baseball uh, performed and participated. And then I heard that the homes were different also. Like, could you describe the homes that people lived in at the time? The housing. It was just awesome. We had beautiful housing in our community. It, it was a heartbreaker to see some of the mansions demolished over the decades. And from mansions to just the small single family homes or what have you. And uh, we continue to fight to this day for mm-hmm. the row houses in the 1500 block of Victor Street. There are 10 houses, but the, the housing was just uh, very impressive because mm-hmm. they were built uh, by our architects, engineers, and so forth. Oh, wow. That's so cool. So in reading about Freedman's Town, I learned that it also had the first Black school in Texas. Deborah, in your research, um, could you tell me what you know about this school and how it was established? So the Gregory School was the first uh, facility built for Black children uh, in Houston, it came out of the uh, Freedman Spiral School. So after the emancipation, three churches in Houston were used to uh, as schools, uh, Antioch, Zion, and Trinity. Uh, Methodists were used as uh, schools for those early emancipated persons of African descent. And later, uh, we had some Black prominent residents who got with White City Fathers and said, hey, we need a bigger building because obviously everybody, once emancipated, wanted to learn how to read. Mm-hmm. So they built the Gregory School, which was at Louisiana and Jefferson. 
And then in around the 1900s, 1903, it was moved to yeah. Victor Street, where it is now. And it's currently the uh, African-American Library at the Gregory School. And it is an archival center today, which houses the history of Black Houston. And at the Yates Library, what kind of things are you preserving about the town exactly? Like what research goes into it? What can people find if they were to come to the library to try to find out more about the town? The Yates uh, is actually a museum house. Mm -hmm. Uh, It once belonged to Rutherford B.H. Yates, who was the son of Jack Yates. And so you will find artifacts. We have archaeology where uh, the archaeologists who work for the museum, Mm -hmm. the uh, museum owns uh, six properties and they've done archaeology on all of them. So the artifacts you see in the house come from those properties of the people who live there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, you will see uh, photos as well. You'll see an exhibit from Prairie View, uh, the Prairie View Architects, where they did three blocks of Freedmanstown to show what was there and what's not there now. We have a Black Mm -hmm. uh, invention uh, room for children. But basically, we are housing uh, everything Freedmanstown of the people who lived in the houses that the museum owns, as well as... Uh, the artifacts that the archaeologists have found. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, we have books on Freedmanstown as well. So when people come to visit the museum, we have a lot to show them. And we are the authentic, and Gladys will attest to this, we are the authentic uh, history uh, uh, preservers of Freedmanstown. Gladys, why do you think so many people don't know about Freedmanstown? That's intentional because uh, 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 I, I sometimes refer to Deborah Sloan as Dr. Sloan mm-hmm. because she's done such an, an excellent job, uh, an impressive job of research and preservation uh, on her own aside from the Yates uh, Print Museum. But um, the media uh, makes sure that we are miseducated. And as uh, Deborah and I, when we came up, we didn't hear about uh, our true history Mm -hmm. in the public school system. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are always taught the so-called history of the Caucasian. And um, that was just really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And then you have only what one month out of the year to Mm -hmm. recognize our heritage. Mm -hmm. Of course I do it every day, you know, 24 seven, but uh, the system, it makes sure that we are not taught the truth. And the other thing, to pick back on what Gladys said, mm-hmm. Freedman's Town has been known as a slum. And I want to I counter that because mm-hmm. most of the Italians, you know, they own some of the property and it was rental property. So my point is, is that if you don't keep that property up and you let it deteriorate, yeah, it's going to look like a slum, but there were uh, property owners in there who, had, as Gladys said, had owned beautiful houses in there that architected when they did the 1984 National Register for Freedmanstown. That were 550 structures of significance. You know how many are left? Mm-hmm. Maybe 50. Wow. So Freedmanstown could have been promoted as, as uh, one of the most unique communities uh, in the country, like they do in, in South Carolina and Georgia and all the other places. But again, because no city fathers came forward to preserve what's left. Mm -hmm. So therefore, people consider it a slum. It is not a slum. It is not. It was a beautiful community where people uh, met and lived and worked together. The architecture was unique. The culture was unique. And so, again, I resent the fact when people call it a slum, when actually the people who owned the rental properties could have kept it up, could have maintained it. Mm -hmm. And what happens is once that property is uh, deteriorating, they tear down and build high-density housing. Mm -hmm. And then that forces people out of the community because now the taxes have gone up and the people who have been there Mm -hmm. from day one, they have to move because of high density housing. And you mentioned the properties. I'm wondering, like whenever you were talking about mansions earlier, Gladys, um, who was living in these mansions? What were those businesses that they were owning? Our people. You have to dig into uh, the research. Mm -hmm. So we were the ones with the money. Mm -hmm. We were the ones who owned the oil fields and we were the bankers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, uh, that's why it was so important to integrate so that the Caucasian population could take our money. Mm -hmm. All right. So we were the ones who owned the mansions. See, we've been so miseducated we think only folks who live in river oaks 
or memorial or the ones who own and, and live, of course, in, in mansions. But mm-hmm. that, that's not true. We keep again, keep in mind that we were robbed and continue being robbed to this day. Mm-hmm. What um, Deborah was saying about the Italians, you see, the Italians were uh, known as Negroes at one time. And um, they had no place to go when they came here to this country and to different, but to our communities, okay? Mm -hmm. So they would set up shop and give lines of credit to, uh, just like, you know, any department store today, you know, you have credit card or whatever. But back then, the mom and pop stores, uh, although we had our own stores in Freemanstown, but with the influx of, you know, Caucasian Italians coming in, they would uh, swindle mm-hmm. the black residents and customers mm-hmm. out of their land by saying, oh, well, you know, you should have paid off this line of credit and grocery store you haven't. And he said, well, wait a minute, it's way more than what it should have been. So therefore, uh, this perpetual theft of our people by the Italians led to the uh, the great land grab, as as it's been known, so that um, by the time uh, when we had gotten the historic district designation back in 1984 on Freemanstown, mm-hmm. uh, the Italians got together as a group, a collective group, and said, well, look, we're not going to sell our land to Negroes. Mm-hmm. It was a losing battle. Mm-hmm. They, it, it was no win because everything was stacked against them, the judges, the court system. The, the politicians. And both of you have touched on this pretty much um, throughout the show, but could you give the listeners an uh, idea of what Freedman's Town is like today? Is it still a thriving Black town or how would you describe it now? It, you know, I wouldn't say it was thriving because now it's been gentrified, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so there, again, I said there are at least 50 uh, historic structures there. The Yates Museum owns six. They own five vacant lots. Gladys has her properties. The city has 25 houses. Mm-hmm. And so and along with that, there may be one or two or three more houses. Well, the Victor shotguns that are there. So um, wow. I see it as a place, a community of gentrification. And it's so disrespectful as to what they are building there. Mm-hmm. It's not comparable to what was there. And I realize that progress has to take place. Uh, I realize that mm-hmm. construction has to take place. But at least let it look like what was there at first. You can't have mm-hmm. uh, stories tall buildings there next to a historic home or historic homes. So, for instance, where there was one historic home, there's this big mass uh, high density housing that was there. Mm-hmm. So I see it as a place that's been gentrified. Also, too, Carly, we uh, the Community Development Corporation of Freemanstown, Freemanstown Association, other nonprofits that were founded in our neighborhood by us. We had our own redevelopment plan Mm -hmm. for Freedmanstown. I mean, very well thought out, out, designed and so forth. We started building some houses in Freedmanstown. We did uh, a a gated community in the 1300 block of Salonier. But our first house, uh, and that was in 2000, but our first house was in 1996 in the uh, uh, 12, 11, Matthew Street, mm-hmm. and it's the first steel frame residential house in Freemanstown. Plus, we did restoration of existing houses, historic houses in the community. And it was for all for low to moderate uh, income working class families. Mm-hmm. I do want to state that, again, the Yates Museum has six historical structures there. Mm-hmm. Uh, those six houses will become museum houses. I'm here if people want a tour. We'll be glad to mm-hmm. give them a tour of Freemanstown. They just need to uh, go on the website and contact the Yates Museum, mm-hmm. leave a message or call, and we will give them the authentic tour of Freemanstown. You know, there's still the history is still there. The stories are still there to be told to the general public. And we want we want to educate people about Freemanstown. People say, oh, it's no longer there. Yeah, the stories are still there. Those structures are still there. And we want to tell the story to people who are willing to come out and hear it. Mm-hmm. And people need to know that. And as Gladys said earlier, we didn't learn this in our books. You know, we didn't learn our own local history. I didn't know Jack Yates was black until I was an adult. Mm -hmm. So kids need to know their local history Mm -hmm. because it's important and it's relevant. I agree. Thank you, ladies, so much for being on CityCast Houston today. Thank you for having us, Carl. Thank you so much. 
That was historical researcher Deborah Blacklock Sloan and longtime Freedman's resident Gladys House. If you want to know more about Freedman's Town, we'll have links to the Yates Museum in our show notes. Now, let's get into what else is going on around town. 3.6 million Texans will be losing a portion of their SNAP food benefits starting today after the U.S. government decided to end the extra payments given to people during the pandemic to help pay for grocery bills. Families who get SNAP benefits will be losing $95 or more a month in Texas, even though grocery bills are increasing. Like, I don't know if y'all have seen the prices of eggs these days, but it's crazy. Even though this news is kind of disheartening for some, Congress is saying that the money will now go to a new program that will help low-income families replace school meals during the summer. So I guess it's not all bad. That's a wrap for the show today. Tune in tomorrow to hear the team chat it up about the best patios in town. This is going to be a good one, y'all, so you don't want to miss it. See y'all tomorrow. Bye. Mm-mm. All right, tea.